So uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Thanks to the uh, uh, Power Network for putting this on. I think this is very important. The uh, uh, this uh, Queen Party policy is very important, and affirming it is very important. Um, I want to deal with a, a specific element of this whole question, which is the whole question of singling Israel out. And I want to deal with it by going through a bit of the history of singling Israel out. Not in a critical way, but in enabling Israel's dispossession of Palestinians. If we're going to talk about singling Israel out, what we have to really talk about is how Canada, for more than a century, has enabled Israel's dispossession of Palestinians. Um, and uh, Zionism in this country does not begin as, as a Jewish movement, it begins as a Christian movement. In the late 1800s, preeminent uh, uh, Christian Zionist was a man by the name of Henry Wentworth Monk, an Ottawa area businessman who campaigned for a dominion of Israel as part of the British Empire, a Jewish homeland in the Middle East as part of the British Empire, just like the dominion of Canada as part of the British Empire. So there was an uh, active Christian Zionist movement decades before there was a Jewish Zionist movement in this country. Uh, to get a sense of this, this uh, thinking, the, the mix of Christian Zionist and British imperial thinking that pushed Canada's support uh, for Zionism pre-state, pre-creation of the State of Israel, Arthur, Arthur Meehan, who, became, uh, who was a Solicitor General and later became Canadian Prime Minister, in 1915 had this to say. I think I can speak for those of the Christian faith when I express the wish that God speed the day when the land of your forefathers shall be yours again. He was talking to a Jewish Canadian audience. This task, I hope, will be performed by that champion of liberty the world over, the British Empire. Um, many people might disagree about whether the British Empire was the force for liberty around the world. Um, <coughs> Canadians fought in the British conquering of Palestine. Hundreds of Canadians fought in the conquering of Palestine uh, from, the, from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Canada Canadians have been raising funds for the Zionist movement for over a century, uh, particularly after the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Significant funds were raised in this country for uh, projects that dispossessed uh, Palestinians. Canada's most important contribution to the dispossession of Palestinians was at the UN in 1947 with the partition plan. When the British mandate of Palestine was, was handed over to the UN to deal with the, the, the British mandate, um, Canadian diplomat Lester Pearson, people I'm sure are familiar with, later becomes Prime Minister, then Serving Minister, then Prime Minister, who was a diplomat at that time, uh, he played an important role on two different UN committees in advancing the Zionist cause. Canadian Supreme Court Justice Ivan C. Rand. Uh, people may be familiar with the Rand formula. Uh, people involved in labor unions are probably familiar with the Rand formula, but union dues, he was the one behind that. Um, Ivan C. Rand uh, was the principal architect of the partition plan. He was part of a delegation, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, that went to the region to decide what to do with the British mandate, and he pushed for the largest Zionist state possible and specifically supported the partition plan, which gave the Zionist movement, which was less than a third of the population, Jewish community was less than a third of the population, owned less than around 7% of the land, partition plan gave the Zionist movement 55% of historic Palestine. Um, it was incredibly unjust from the standpoint of, uh, of a Palestinian perspective. Uh, it was giving their homeland over to, to the, uh, to uh, the Zionist movement. And the partition plan gave the Zionist movement the international legitimacy to ethnically cleanse Palestine. In late 1947, 48, where 700 to 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes. Of course, there were hundreds of Canadians that were part of that process. The Israeli Air Force at the time was, was heavily Canadian. Uh, Canadian was the head of the Air Force. Uh, those are Canadians that had fought during World War II, Canadian military. So Canada was part of the process of the dispossession of Palestinians even, both, even before the creation of the State of Israel. 
Um, and that has continued on in different ways over the years, and I'll deal with only a couple because I don't have that much time. Um, one element, an important element of Canada's support for Israel today that receives very little attention is the question of charities. Right? There are hundreds, one estimate, mid-90s estimates, that there's 300 char charities in this country that raise funds for projects in Israel. Okay? Uh, uh, in 1991, the Ottawa Citizen said it was between 100 and 200 million dollars a year that was raised for charities in Israel. Uh, not, with inflation, that would probably be about twice that number, so two to four hundred million, let's say. Uh, Israel's a wealthy country, right? There's not hundreds of millions of dollars of, of charitable donations going to Sweden or going to France. Israel's a fairly wealthy country, so the big, even the whole question of charities, I think, should be. Uh, uh, should be uh, put under a bit of a microscope. Um, but many of these charities that are registered charities, it's important, registered charities means that when you, when you donate to them, individuals can get a tax receipt. So it's effectively subsidized by the Canadian state. These donations are subsidized by the Canadian state. A number of these charities are very, should be viewed as very controversial. Charities that support the Israeli military, right? Um, groups like the Lone Soldier Center that gets uh, 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 Jewish youth that don't have family in Israel that supports them to move to Israel and join the IDF. Groups like Association for Soldiers of Israel in Canada and a number of others uh, that support the, the Israeli military that have registered uh, that are registered charities in this country. Also, as Dimitri mentioned, there's the Jewish National Fund. Right? Jewish National Fund was at the core of uh, the, uh, uh, the Zionist project, the colonization of Palestine. It was an organization set up in Europe in 1901 uh, to, to uh, gather land, Palestinian land, uh, uh, and uh, to, to build uh, uh, the Israeli state. It excludes non-Jews from its land. Right? It's an explicitly racist organization. These are, we had these policies, there were policies in this country into late 40s, early 50s uh, that allowed the exclusion of people of Chinese descent, of Jews, of, of black people, of indigenous people from uh, uh, different communities in Canada. Those were all struck down by Canadian courts late 40s, early 50s. The Jewish National Fund continues to, do, to, to until today, 2016, explicitly uh, racist land covenants, racist land use policies to exclude the 20% of Israelis that are not Jewish. And, but it's a registered charity in 2014, I think it raised about $28 million in this country. The Jewish National Fund also has something called Canada Park, which I'm sure some people are familiar with, which was built on the remnants of three Palestinian villages that were destroyed in 1967. Uh, and, and the people who were driven from their homes uh, aren't, aren't able to return in part because there's a, a Canada park on their land that the Jewish National Fund of Canada raised, has raised tens of millions of dollars for that, uh, for that project. Uh, and and it's, you know, the Toronto police have donated to it. There's a Diefenbaker uh, byway that bisects the park, Diefenbaker, former Canadian Prime Minister. Um, so uh, Jewish National Fund should also be a very uh, controversial uh, charity that, that has some registered uh, charitable status in this country. Also, there are charities that uh, support settlement projects that are registered charities. Groups like Christian Friends of Israeli Communities that openly states that it raises funds for projects in what it calls Judea and Samaria, which is the uh, biblical right-wing Israeli term for uh, the West Bank, occupied uh, West Bank. It's a historical name for it. Historical. So, so uh, Canadian charities uh, are involved with the Israeli military. There's uh, uh, the, uh, support racist institutions, explicitly racist institutions, support projects that that that, that enable the the uh, the settlement project in the West Bank. Um, but you have to look at this in the context of the other side or the the crass double standard that goes on. On the other side, when it comes to Palestinian charities, the Canadian government has, uh, has criminalized so many Palestinian political organizations that it's very difficult uh, for charities to operate freely 
uh, and supporting Palestinians. Uh, the, the, the preeminent, preeminent example is IRFAN, the uh, International Relief Agency for the Afflicted and Needy. It's a, a, a Muslim, mostly Muslim-based charity in Toronto. And it, it, um, it had its uh, charitable status cut off, and in fact was listed as a terrorist organization. It's actually on the list now as a banned terrorist organization. Because it was uh, providing support for orphans in Gaza, and because it provided a, a dialysis machine to a hospital in Gaza. The, the, the money for the orphans went through the post office, the post office run by the political authority in Gaza, Hamas, which is a banned terrorist organization in Canada. The dialysis machine went to the hospital, to a hospital in Gaza. The hospital under the health ministry run, again, by Hamas, banned terrorist organization. So IRFAN actually had its charitable status cut off and then listed as a banned terrorist organization for supporting some orphans in Gaza and for supporting a hospital in Gaza. So on one hand, you can support the Israeli military, you can support settlements, you can support racist organization, and you can have your operation subsidized by the Canadian state, and there's millions, tens and tens of millions of dollars going to that every year. On the other hand, if you uh, are found to be supporting, uh, uh, in, or in any way have any connection to Hamas or half a dozen other Palestinian political organizations that are banned terrorist organizations in this country, you can you lose your charitable status, and you yourself, your organization, find yourself uh, on a terrorist list, and you could potentially be pursued uh, 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 criminally. So it's an incredible uh, double standard that receives almost no attention, and, and I, I very much applaud the Green Party's resolution on the Jewish National Fund for having, for the first time in, in I think, in decades in this country, since a very good documentary at CBC in the early 90s, to have shown a light on the Jewish National Fund and the racism of the Jewish National Fund and the fact that it's a registered charity it's being subsidized by our, by our tax uh, uh, dollars. Another important component of understanding the, the question of Canada's ties uh, or double standards or policy with regards to Israel-Palestine is in fact the Canadian aid that uh, our government gives to Palestinians. And uh, in fact, it's not aid by what it, most people, most of it's not aid by what most people would think of as aid. It's uh, explicitly a tool to enhance the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. And this is not just me, state, me stating this. This is from the mouth of the president of the Canadian International Development Agency in 2012, Margaret Biggs. Uh, we have the access to information, internal documents that make that very clear. So the Canadian government, when, the, when Hamas won legislative elections in 2006, cut off aid to the Palestinians. Okay, it was a way to put pressure on, uh, on uh, the, the uh, Fatah and the Palestinian Authority and, and put pressure on, um, uh, to undermine uh, the, the, the election. And uh, so the Canadian cut off money. Uh, then when there was, uh, they, they sort of basically pushed for a, a, a low-level civil war between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, and when the Palestinian unity government collapsed, Canada rushed in to provide aid to, uh, to Fatah-led Palestinian Authority in the, in the West Bank. Uh, aid money, um, which was uh, for uh, something called Operation Proteus, which was for training a Palestinian security force in the West Bank, under the direction of U.S. General Keith Dayton, a force of about 10,000 uh, 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 men. And uh, in December of 2007, Canada announced $300 million five-year aid program to the Palestinians. Uh, most of that money went to training and building the security force, which, according to Canadian Ambassador John Allen, said it was, quote, to ensure that the PA, the Palestinian Authority, maintains control of the West Bank against Hamas to support one Palestinian political faction against another Palestinian political faction, the Palestinian political faction that was most compliant in the face of Israel's ongoing uh, settlement uh, project. So that's part of what it was about. Um, and in 2012, when the, the Palestinian Authority pursued its statehood bid at the UN, the Canadian government, to just deter the Palestinian statehood bid at the UN, the Canadian government threatened to withdraw its aid to the Palestinian Authority. 
Okay? And we have the internal documents from Margaret Biggs uh, discussing the matter at the time. And she made it very clear that Israel was putting pressure on Canada not to cut off aid to the Palestinian Authority. And this is what Margaret Biggs, the head of Canadian International Development Agency, said at the time. She said, quote, There have been increasing references in the past months during high-level bilateral meetings with the Israelis about the importance and value they place on Canada's assistance to the Palestinian Authority, most notably in the security justice reform. Okay, so Israel's pressure in Canada to continue supporting the Palestinian security forces. Now, Margaret Biggs also explains the broader objective of the Palestinian security force from the perspective of Canada, the US, Israel, uh, Britain, that are training about the three countries training the Palestinian security force, um, and, and Israel, which is vetting. So the Shin Bet vets all the Palestinian, all the potential uh, uh, Palestinian uh, 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 security uh, uh, forces. And uh, this, is what Mar this is what Margaret Biggs had to say. Quote, the emergence of popular protests on the Palestinian streets against the Palestinian Authority is worrying and, in, and the Israelis have been imploring the international donor community to continue to support the Palestinian Authority. So we are giving our aid money to build up a Palestinian security force that can uh, uh, put down popular protests against the Palestinian Authority that is uh, the electoral mandate of Abbas ended in early 2009, so there's no, no electoral legitimacy anymore, that is totally compliant in the face of ongoing settlement expansion uh, in the West Bank. And, uh, and, and I think it need, we need to look at this in a bigger picture broader understanding of colonialism. Colonialism, uh, colonial uh, uh, governments around, throughout history have always wanted locals to do, a, do as much of the security work as possible. It wasn't British forces that oversaw um, all of the security work in India during British colonial rule in India, of course. There were Brits usually at the top end of things. Uh, but it was mostly Indians who were doing the different uh, security work overseeing uh, uh, British colonial policy in India. And Israel is no, no different. Israel would prefer to have compliant Palestinians do as much of their dirty work as possible. What's unique about the situation is the fact that it's the US, Canada, Britain that are uh, uh, doing the project of building up that security force uh, uh, to, to oversee Israel's occupation. So, my point in laying all of this information out is many, many more details that I go into my book, Canada and Israel Building Apartheid, that goes to the history of Canadian support for the dispossession of Palestinians. But today, when we talk about a resolution uh, about uh, boycott divestment sanctions around, around, uh, around the settlements or around the occupation, um, this is not a question of, of singling Israel out. This is, this is at best, writing a little bit of the historical wrong that our government, our institutions have contributed to. At best, a very nominal writing of the historical wrong. And people here in Edmonton, uh, there is, this, there is a, a, the special convention coming up where it's an obviously an incredibly undemocratic thing that's happened that the party leadership has done. Uh, for those of you who can make it down there, uh, for you, those of you who are Green Party members, who, who want to join the Green Party, in my opinion, and actually I have no doubt about this, confirming this policy, as limited as it is, but frankly, it's, it's limited, uh, as limited as it is, would be the most significant Palestinian solidarity victory in the history of this country. Uh, it is important, and I implore anybody who who uh, wants to, uh, to advance the cause of justice on this question uh, to, to do what you can to either get down there, uh, call up people you know in Calgary. Uh, this is important. Uh, and, um, and I uh, strongly implore people to, to, uh, to uh, get mobilized on this. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much.